Hello and welcome to this webinar. And uh, I'm uh, Dr. Professor John Aru Phillips. I'm the Dean of the School of Education and Cognitive Science at Asia E University, which is uh, based here in Malaysia. The Uh, before I begin, I would like to make a few things uh, uh, clear here about this presentation. First is that this presentation is focused on uh, writing a doctoral research proposal for the behavioral and social sciences. That means things like management, education, psychology, and sociology. And for, and for this purpose, I'm focusing only on the quantitative research proposal. The qualitative research pro pro proposal re will require an, another session. And here, the assumption is that you are doing the PhD or a doctoral program, which is fully dependent on the submission of a thesis, fully dependent on one thesis. However, you could use the ideas here for those of you who are doing doctoral programs where it's partial fulfillment for your thing. However, whatever is mentioned in this short session may vary according to your institution. So check with your institutions whether these, uh, uh, this, this, the ideas expressed here may uh, are, are relevant or not. Now, Let's look at that word research now, research in the behavioral and social sciences. I, I think Creswell gives a very good definition of uh, what is research, because I'm assuming that many of you who are doing a doctoral program, not many of you have experience in research, done any research, uh, done any substantial work work. So I think this session will be useful. Now, it's a systematic process to collect and analyze information to increase our understanding of our topic. The key word is systematic. And you begin with posing a question, collect data to answer the question, and then you present an answer to the question or based on your data. And there are, in the behavioral and social sciences, we use a variety of methods, quantitative methods uh, of doing research. For example, we use the interview, we, we, we conduct surveys, we use surveys, we do experiments, okay? Uh, we have focus groups, we observe, we analyze documents, okay? And we use an assortment of instruments. It can be a questionnaire, uh, psychometric measures, different kind of scales, inventories, and so on and so forth. Basically, in the behavioral and social sciences, we are trying to measure the human condition. So th that is the focus of behavioral and social sciences. Now, this is a, a thing that bugs a lot of beginning or beginning researchers or beginning PhD students. How do I start off? How do I look for a topic? Now, I've got this interesting, uh, I have a little suggestion here. You may or may not agree with it. I think you have Google with you. Start off with just Googling the topic. You have a broad idea of what you want to do. Google it. Okay. And if possible, try to be as narrow as possible in the, in the choice of words you, you want to, to study, the, the topic you want to study. And you will see, the moment you, 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 you put in the word, you will see millions of pages coming up, web pages. And you, as you read some of the pages, you will see certain names of people coming up in the field you are studying. For example, I, I, I just put the word uh, factors influencing job satisfaction. I got nearly 11 billion web pages on that alone. So you can imagine, you start off with Google and then keep on looking at an assortment of material ranging from research articles, uh, even full dissertations, theses are available on Google and then research reports. 
That's the first stage. And then once you have got your thing zeroed in, go to the next stage, and that is use Google Scholar. Google Scholar is another great search engine, which is a bit more precise. You will get PDF files of research articles, research reports. Sometimes it is just a synopsis, an abstract. So there's a hold of resources that. Then the third stage, when you start drilling and drilling, and you start uh, drilling the web, and, and, and you narrow down your topic, you go into your own institution's digital library. In Asia E-University, we call it the Knowledge Center. And in that Knowledge Center, we have uh, thousands or millions of articles, reports, textbooks, e-books, and so on and so forth. And uh, the most pop popular databases are like ProQuest. ProQuest, we have for ProQuest for education, ProQuest for business, ProQuest for IT. Then Eric, Eric is essentially for education. AppHost, AppSco, AppSco Host is another huge database they've got for education, they've got for business. Then you have very specific databases like in, in child development, early childhood, Emerald has got large resources and EBSCO hosts ebooks. So that is, it depends on your institution's subscription to various kinds of databases. So that's the third stage. You go down drilling into the large amount of data to, 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 to finalize your research topic. Now, what is a research proposal? Okay. The key word just now you said research is to find answers to questions you have posed. That's the meaning of research. Proposal is an outline of what you intend to do. In this case, what you intend to research on. Now, always keep in mind you are writing for someone who is going to read your proposal. Is you're not writing for yourself. So keep in mind the reader who's going to read and judge your proposal. The word judge or evaluate your proposal. He could be called an examiner. He could be called a reader and so on and so forth. Now, actually, the research proposal is like telling a story. Tell a story about the topic you're going to investigate. Show your passion about the topic you want to investigate. And most importantly, you must indicate to the reader that you understand your topic in depth. Okay? Then uh, it has often been said that the thesis is, the, is only as good as your research proposal. Okay? In other words, a poor research proposal will result in a poor thesis. I think this is very, very true. That's why it's so important to get your proposal right, right the first time. Now, this is another question that bugs students and students always are doctoral students. What should I focus on in my research proposal? How long should it be? Now, here I've just proposed uh, uh, the, a kind of a breakdown of the research proposal. Basically, there are three sections. Sometimes you want to call it chapters, you can do that. The first is called the introduction. Then the second is called the review or literature. The third is called methodology. Now, remember, all these three, you tell your reader what you intend to do. And the number of words varies with institutions. Okay, How, how long should a research proposal be? Now, here, I'm, I'm going in the range of about 8,500 to 9,000 words for your research proposal. Pages you translate it, whether you, you, you are using uh, double spacing and so on and so forth. So roughly the introduction will be about 2,000 to 2,002. Review literature, 3,005 to about 37. And the methodology, about 3,900 to 3,000 words. So that's a very, very rough range of words. Now, there is a lot of meaning in the words here. You don't have many words to play around with. So for that reason, you've got to practice the three C's. 
in your research proposal because don't ramble. First is clear. When your research proposal is not clear, that means it's not easy to understand. Is it easy to understand? Sometimes you must write even as though a person not in the field can understand what you're planning to do. It should be that kind of simplicity, easy to understand. Later, I'll, I'll explain in more detail. Concise, get straight to the point. Okay? And because you don't have many words, you don't want to waste the number of words you have telling, uh, putting in irrelevant information for the reader. And, and don't, as they always say, don't irritate the reader. Okay? The third C is coherence. That means the argument, you are putting forward an argument for your study. And it must flow. Very important. Sentence by sentence, line by line must flow. Okay, the argument must hold together. In actual fact, when you do a research proposal, you're selling yourself. Okay, just like a salesman will try to sell his product, you similarly are selling your idea you want to investigate to maybe two people, three people, or how many people who read your research proposal. Always keep in mind the reader where, 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 when you write. Now, let's start with the introduction. Remember the three words? Introduction, review, literature, and methodology. Now, in the introduction, there is roughly about eight subsections in the introduction. You start out with the background of the study. It's like a funnel, you know? You have a working title. You have a rough title. Remember that the title can change. It's called a working title for your research proposal. The title which later becomes your thesis. Now, working title, which may change after the defense of your research proposal and while working with your supervisor, the working title. And then you start with background. Now, what is background? You, in a very short number of words, in a short paragraph, begin with a broad perspective of your problem. And it should be simple enough. Remember, I said that even persons not in the field can understand the language you use. Okay, avoid cutting and pasting from other sources because the flow, the coherence won't be there if you do that. You debate the issue in this little beginning paragraph. Debate the issue to investigate. And this is where you convince readers why you want to study. Sort of give a rationale for, for the study. Later, you will develop the rationale later. You convince readers that this is a worthwhile study you want to investigate. Now, after the background, you go to what we call statement of the problem, or sometimes they use the word problem statement. Now, this word confuses a lot of students, especially novices in the field of research. It is something, the, the statement of the problem is a problem statement, which is some sort of a gap between what should be the ideal and what is in reality, okay? What is actually happening and what you see you, is the ideal. That's a gap. And that gap creates a problem. And that is what you want to study, okay? What you desire and what for in reality. So there's what falls short of the ideal. And that becomes your problem statement in which you describe how passionate you are about the problem, how significant is the problem you want to study, the rationale for it. In a very short paragraph, you don't have to describe. In a set, maybe one or two paragraphs, you explain your problem statement. And importantly is the research gap. Now, this research gap is something as you read the literature, you find that there is something which has not been answered or not been resolved with regards to your problem. And the findings... In, your, in what you read is controversial, debatable, okay? And maybe the existing uh, researchers in what you want to investigate have not addressed the kind of sample of respondents you want to investigate. And maybe there are factors that are not explored with regards to your research problem. And sometimes it's also because 
culturally, this has not been widely explored in your culture, or you want to include the influence of your culture in the in 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 the research problem. So these are all you discuss under problem statement. That becomes the focal point of your study. The third part of your of the introduction chapter or section is the purpose. You tell the reader in very clear-cut terms, you know, maybe a short paragraph, the purpose is a broad statement of the desired outcome or the general intention of your study, what you want to accomplish. I give, I give a simple example here. The purpose of the study is to determine the influence of personal factors, leadership style, organizational commitment, on staff satisfaction in the technology sector in Kuala Lumpur or Malaysia. Sometimes they, they, they think must ref, it, it quite very closely related to your thesis title. Then you can you can expand this a bit and, and you can say, number one, objective. This is the same thing as objectives of the study or purpose of the study. You can give two or three objectives of the study. Now, remember, they are objectives. Okay? what you intend to do in it you tell the the, the the reader then the comes the fourth part you you it goes down as a funnel from the problem statement you go down to your research question now what is a research question we we use a lot of in quantitative research we use research question i will focus only on research questions here it focuses the study now you're getting very very focused Okay, it stipulates the interaction between two variables. Okay, then you can you can write a little bit there, and then at the end of your little paragraph there, you can use this statement. Specifically, the study seeks to answer the following relation uh, question. Okay, now look at your research question. Number one, is it still very broad? Is it too narrow? Okay. It does the research question show relationship between variables? Okay. Does the research question try to solve a problem? Okay. Does, is the research question researchable? It's no point putting a research question in the way you don't have the resources to, to answer the research question. You may not have the sample to answer the research question. And very importantly, the research question is measurable. Okay. You say, for example, you, you, you do an experiment, uh, co comparing your, your study is on an experiment comparing two teaching methods to teach children how to be critical thinkers. You got method A, method B. So your research question will be, is there a difference in, in the critical thinking of a uh, male and female student using method A or method B? Now, that's a research question. Is there say so gender? You see the variables inside that is gender factor. Your dependent variable is the critical critical thinking test, and the treatment you give your student. Maybe you have developed a particular teaching method to teach critical thinking to maybe primary school kids or even kindergarten ch children. So that's a research question. Just be very very careful with your research question because readers of your of your proposal. Will, will question your research question. Is it measurable? What are the variables in the research question? Do you, are you, is, does your research question solve the problem? Can you find answers to the research question? Or is it still too broad? Okay. And is the research question something you are curious about? That's research question. The fourth part of your introduction uh, section or chapter. Then you come to the fifth part where you present the conceptual framework. Now, this is a very common uh, question you'll be asked often in your defense of your research proposal. What is your conceptual framework? Now, students get confused with conceptual framework and theoretical framework. I, I'll explain here theoretic, uh, for these purposes here, we have put conceptual framework under introduction. We'll put the theoretical framework 
in the second section that is review of literature or chapter two or, or section two. Now, Miles and Huberman give a very nice definition of what is a conceptual framework. A conceptual framework is a graphical or narrative form or expression of the main concepts, factors, or variables studied and the presumed relationships between them. So you can give uh, a diagrammatic uh, uh, representation of your study. And, and there's a little trick I, I, I've used often. Take a string of variables you want to study, put it in Google, and you check under images, and you'll get hundreds of uh, diagrams, which they claim is their conceptual frame. Be very careful when you look at each one of them that shows the interaction between the variables. So it's a good way to get ideas for your study how you want to string the variables you want to study together in a form of a diagram. Uh, I always encourage my, my students to come up with a diagram. I think the diagram is the, is, is the nicest thing. I mean, it's the, it's the most, it's the, sorry, it's a easier way to, to, to read about what you're trying to do. Now, remember, the conceptual framework is constructed by the researcher. You constructed it. Okay? You construct it. It's a map connecting the key ideas or the, or, or the key ideas or the factors. Okay? The key ideas or the, the factors, the variables connecting, the, uh, connecting uh, in, in your study. It shows the relationships between the variables. Between the independent variable, you have the dependent variable, you have mediating variable, you can even have a, 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 a few other variables, uh, uh, confounding variable, con uh, mediating variables, and the phenomena you want to analyze. At a glance, when somebody looks at your conceptual framework, as you present it as a diagram, the person knows what you want to study. Okay, And interestingly, you can work backwards. From the conceptual framework, you can draw out your research questions. Okay, I'll give you an example here. Now, this is just a fictitious example, uh, which I created as a study. It's a conceptual framework involving four variables here. There are independent variable, leadership styles, personal characteristics, and then there's a mediating variable, which is organizational commitment, and finally, job satisfaction. A dependent variable. This is a kind of study you can do it in, in education, you can do it in technology, you can do it in uh, nursing education, you can do it in business, you can uh, management, psychology, sociology, and so on and so forth. It has that broad kind of thing. So look at this. If you look at this, this is a concept example of a conceptual. If you just look at this, you can see so many re research questions can come out from this conceptual framework. That's the beauty of the conceptual framework. It, you, can, you can look at, for example, I'll give you an example of a, a, a desk leadership style influence job satisfaction among workers. Okay, Does the perceived leadership style vary with males and females? Okay, the so leadership style. And what is the role uh, of organizational commitment in determining job job satisfaction in the technology industry you can say in the, in the school you can you can take in the in the manufacturing sector in the banking sector and so on and so forth so that is a nice conceptual framework I, if you type in as i said you type in any of these variables into your in google or google scholar or even your own digital library you will get thousands or millions of articles on this kind of topic. So this is the conceptual framework. So don't confuse it. It's your creation. Okay? Basically, it is your creation. You're showing the relationships between the variables you want to study. You see the independent variable, dependent variable, and the mediating variable. The sixth part of your number of the introduction section of your proposal is called significance. Then somebody they'll ask you, what, what's so great about your study? How, how is your study going to contribute to anything? 
some people even may, may be very cynically say, oh, it's, uh, uh, it's al- isn't it already obvious? Why do you want to spend three to four years studying something which is very obvious? Uh, this is a very challenge for you. Don't look at it as a criticism, but look at it as a challenge. If somebody were to tell you, your study is no big great, this is where they say uh, it's not a great deal. Okay. Now, number one, usually we look at these three three areas. You can add on the significance of a study. How does your study contribute to practice, especially in the behavioral and social sciences? We are studying the human being, the human condition. Now, how will your study affect practice, whether managers, teachers, principals, uh, CEOs, and so on, the people? How will it affect practice? your practice, middle-level management, and so on and so forth, okay? The second one we always look at is, how does your study contribute to knowledge and theory, existing knowledge? You will, obviously, your study will be based on one theory or several theories. Now, how does your study add on to what is available, what theories available today in the field, knowledge and theory? And finally, we always look at contribution to policy. We would like to do that. But how will your study help in, in, in the design of maybe or, or, or adaptation or the coming up with new policies regarding the, the phenomena you're studying? Remember, it's a phenomena you're studying. That's the significance of study. You can add on others. So I'll, let, I'll just focus on these three. After significance comes the word limitations. Now, this can be a very challenging thing for doctoral students, beginning students, where putting the limitation is not an indication that your proposal is a weak proposal. Keep in mind that. Somebody will say, oh, if I tell too many limitations, then I'm selling myself short. Then you will say that, oh, they think that this is not a good piece of work. My, my, My proposal is not good. And uh, among the limitations are these, but you've got to be very cautiously, you have to write. Don't, um, I mean, uh, you see, like, for example, lack of probability sampling. This can happen because, because of the time frame you have and the accessibility to your sample, you cannot ensure random assignment. So you may have to do stratified sampling. You may do uh, purposive sampling and so on. So you cannot ensure random sampling. So you may, you may indicate that as a, as a, as a weakness. And in, when you're doing an experiment, you're comparing uh, method A, method B, or you're comparing inter- intervention A against intervention B, when you do a quasi-experimental design, when you, the moment you do quasi-experimental design, you are assuming you cannot, uh, you're telling the reader, I cannot randomize the selection of subjects for my experiment. So I use a quasi-experimental design. Then, in because sometimes when you do experiments, you have to conduct it over a pace of time. Say you're trying to do teaching methods or two intervention strategies in the workplace for counseling or some management strategies or something. Then the time frame, because you don't have the luxury of time, which may also affect some of your findings. So you, you can indicate that as, 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 a, as, a, as a limitation. And uh, you, you, you are constrained by time. But you still uh, can get good findings given the time you have. Sample size is a big issue. Uh, remember, a sample is accessible sample. You would love to have big sample because you, you confine yourself to this smaller sample why explain financial resources uh, sometimes is may not you may not want to say that too much because you're a this thing uh, lack of previous research maybe in in what you're doing as a limitation uh, maybe certain uh, characteristics have not been and uh, studied in your culture maybe the certain unique them and then the research bias uh, this is more for qualitative research be careful where researcher bias can creep in. In quantitative research, it's not so bad because you you get people to, when you do an interview, yes, you might be biased. Even though your questionnaire is structured 
be very wary of research bias. The way you ask questions, you may bias the respondent toward answering in a certain way. And the other one which we always get concerned about in quantitative research, most of your our data collection methods are using questionnaires. We use uh, uh, psychometric tests. We use inventories and all kinds of tests we use to measure the variables. Now, uh, when a person and he's self-reported, we expect the person to answer truthfully. So that is the kind of thing we, we do fear that they may not be telling the truth, so to speak. Okay, they are not the actual responses. So this is the thing about, about uh, social science research or behavioral science research we do in education, management, and some elements in the, in the, in the medical and uh, allied uh, health uh, sector. Okay, these are limitations. So be cautious, do, do indicate. Now, the last one, uh, the last uh, part of your topic uh, introduction is definition of terms. Now, basically, the definition of terms are word uh, uh, terms you are using in your research proposal that is unique to your study. Okay, define terms and concepts used in the study. Okay. Uh, Define technical terms, unfamiliar terms. For example, uh, say you, one of your variables, independent variables, is socioeconomic status. Okay, you may want to tell, uh, you may want to tell the reader that the, for my study, socioeconomic status is measured based on father's education, mother's education, and income. There could be another study which based their definition of socioeconomic purely on income, regardless. So that's why your study is unique uh, in a way because you're telling the reader, I, I uh, use socioeconomic status based on measuring the following. Okay. So what you do is that you in your research proposal, you list the, put the word in bold and explain the definition of it. So that's called definition. Sometimes they use the word operational definition of term. Operational meaning that it is unique to your study in, in your study. Okay? In your study. Okay. The second part, the review of literature. Now, this is, there are lots of variations in how uh, the review of literature is presented and uh, it varies with the institution. Here, I'm suggesting one format. There are, you can divide it into two parts. One is your theoretical framework, and the other one is the literature, the related literature. I'll explain it later. Now, theoretical framework. Now, this is a very confusing thing for many uh, doctoral students when they come before the panel defending their research proposal when someone says, what is the theoretical frame, framework? What is the theoretical foundation of your study? Okay. What do you base your study on? So don't get, this will definitely, a question will be asked. But if you explain it clearly in your, in, in, in your, in your research proposal, then that, that problem is solved. Now, basically, what's the theory? Look at the two words there, theory, theoretical framework or theory and framework. Theory is a statement explaining a phenomena by specifying the relations among variables. Okay, say a theory on self-esteem, a theory on job satisfaction. There are lots of theories about it. That's a theory explaining the relationships among variables. That the important part is the theory must be testable. You can measure that theory. You can test the theory. Okay, in our sect. The, 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 the natural scientists will test the theory in the lab. We test the theory by using various kinds of instruments we give to our subjects. Or we may do an experiment in the classroom. We may do an experiment, experiment in the workplace where you have a control group, experimental group, and we give a certain uh, treatment to test the theory. Theory allows one to make predictions. Yeah, it makes predictions. Okay? 
And uh, in the behavioral and social sciences, the theories usually explain how humans behave. Things like attitude, aptitude, and all that. They're all human conditions, which they say. Now, let's look at the second part. Okay, the word framework. Now, uh, oh, sorry. Ah, framework. What's a framework? Now, in many of our, the doctoral program, many of us do a, a, a study. Some of us may, some of the studies, the nature is that you may draw only on one theory, but most often you have uh, several theories backing your study, be becoming the foundation of your study, the theoretical framework. It's like a house, the framework, okay? Like the beams, the foundation, the pillars are holding up the house. So you draw upon several theories and you knit the theories together into a framework to explain the phenomena you're studying. You see, the phenomena you're studying is, I put a plural there. There are many phenomena you're studying, phenomena you're studying not one. So you knit the theories together into a framework. So that's why it's called theoretical framework. Maybe I'll give an example to illustrate. Go back to our conceptual framework earlier. So you look at this. I go back to the, the thing. You look at the theories for the variables being studied. Uh, leadership styles. There are three types. Very common thing. Transformative, transactional, lazy, fair. Organizational commitment. There are three. Three dimensions. Then job satisfaction. A host. Uh, various ways of defining job satisfaction. Here, I think there are nine types. Eight or nine types. Now, this, you have to go in depth. You got to look at all the theories. Who are the great people who espouse these theories? of leadership okay you have to write about them so because your study is based on this on these variables you have to explore this theory so today i gave example the multi-factor leadership theory uh, three component commitment theory job surveys these are different theories so look at all leadership also abundant uh, information and so many theories on leadership styles, leadership traits, and so on and so forth. Organizational commitment is another one. So this is where your reading must come in. It is so essential for a doctoral student to read. And please read the original works, not a review or literature of someone else. Because of the internet, it is so tempting to read the review or literature of someone else. You read the lit review or literature of someone else to look at the references so that from the references, you can go to the original works. And I think you're very lucky that the abundance of original works freely available on the web. We Sometimes you don't even have to, I mean, you, excluding your di own digital library of your own institution. It's better you go to ProQuest, Epcos, look into those databases so this is where you must be very very well grounded in the theories your study is based on and you must be very convincing in the defense of your proposal to tell the readers what is your theoretical framework so this is the theoretical framework your theory is based on so please see so this one requires a, a number of pages to write on it you decide how how much depth you want to go in because it's a proposal maybe you don't need to go too too much in depth and later when you write your full thesis you may want to dwell on this part very uh in, in great depth this is important because this is where that when you do a study you collect quantitative data someone were to ask you what are you trying to prove what theories underlies that this is the thing this is your answer the names of these people should come to you naturally. The greats in the theory, the name of the theory, the person who designed the theory, criticisms of the theory. Then there's another theory to explain the same phenomena. He added on some more dimensions and so on and so forth. So there is a constant uh, discussion about theory. Then a theory and a theoretical framework. Then your second part of chapter two or section two is your literature review. 
I have a tendency to encourage my students to, when this section comes, to look at research articles. Research articles about your research questions. Remember your research question? The variables, the conceptual framework, all articles. Say, for example, they studied factor X. What is the research on factor X? Factor Y, variable Y, variable Z, Z. What is the, 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 the literature on it? What, what is the actual research people? Are? And if you are, your study is on the, say, for example, your study is in schools. So try to pick up research articles in schools. If you are doing in the technology sector, then try to find for research articles in the technology sector. Make it as precise, as zero in as possible, because there's so much out there. You have to make a decision how to choose what you want. So try to choose research articles which are very closely related to your variables you're studying. Okay? It will throw light on what you are studying. Because later, when you actually collect the data, in Chapter 5 of your thesis, you have to relate your findings to what other people have found. So this is very important. This is when, when you talk about what other people have found about the topic or the variables you're studying, this is it. It's here. So look at articles, report, thesis, conference, and all uh, uh, thesis, conference, proceeding, monographs, areas of conflict, research gaps, okay? Research approaches. How did they, how did they collect the data? What instrument did they use? Okay. How did they analyze research methods, patterns? How did they analyze the data? Okay. Did they use path analysis? Did they use multiple regression? Did they use uh, multivariate analysis of variance? That kind of thing. Why did they use the MANOVA? Why did they use ANOVA? Okay. Look at that. Demonstrate your knowledge of the topic. And you're actually summarizing the studies. You know? And I always tell people, if you can get a, a hard copy or now you can have a soft copy, keep a file of all what you have read, all the articles in a folder. And if you want, you can break it up. Ah, this one, organizing the thing. So each research article, you organize them according to subtopics. Some people organize it according to your research question. Some organize it according to the variables. Say, for example, gender and uh, job satisfaction, one subcategory. All research on gender and job satisfaction, for example. Organizational commitment and job satisfaction, another subheading. All research done on that. So all research done on that and zero in. Research done on that in the technology industry or in, in the school, in the primary school or in kindergarten and so on and so forth. Okay? So... Be very precise. Uh, you have the large number of things. So there's a lot of time to be spent on review of literature. Please do not cut and paste from other people's review of literature. Okay? Make it your origin. Because this is where you develop the expertise in your field. You know the background of your study, the, the great people. And later when you collect the data, you can relate it. So this is where a good doctoral student shows that he has a good command of the topic. He understands the field in depth. So this part, don't look at it as just to fulfill a requirement. When you review a literature, just pick up a few and put it together and submit. No, you must understand. Read the original works. Then keep your own voice. This one is in between. You bring in your voice. When you connect the, the studies, you can make small that your opinion sometimes can come in in between. There are a lot of techniques how to write your review literature. I can't go into it. You can go to my website. I will give you the website, the words to use to connect the topics. And, and don't make uh, how to avoid your literature becoming very boring. Okay? Next one. In the third part comes to your, I'm okay, going to rush a bit, methodology. Methodology basically... There are about five parts, I think. The research design. Tell this is tell the research, tell the reader what research method are you using up front. 
are using the experimental method, quasi-experimental method, correlational method, causal comparative. Are you using survey? Survey means you're giving a questionnaire. You're giving people a set of instruments okay, to measure different variables. They are, they, they are self-reported. Uh, so appropriateness of the methodology. Why do you need to do an experiment for your research problem? Why do you want to collect? Why do you use a survey for appropriateness? How do you achieve the goal? Rationale for it. And some of the assumptions, you can even put some assumptions and strengths and weaknesses of this particular uh, methodology. That's under research design. Don't get confused with that word, research design. Then the data collection techniques. Now, how do you plan to collect the data? Okay, say, for example, if your study depends on a questionnaire, an attitude scale, personality inventory, psychometric tests, all these kinds of things, tell you how you how you want to administer the instrument. Okay, how how uh, how what kind of returns? If you are doing mail questionnaire, you're sending to people, what kind of returns do you expect? How do you plan to gather in 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 the good old days? We used to gather students or the, our respondents in a, in a room and give the questionnaire. Now with the COVID, I think you have to use a lot of online responses. Who will administer the questionnaire? What instructions will you give the, the respondent? Okay, say for example, many are using uh, online uh, questionnaire like SurveyMonkey and other. How do you plan to collect the data? How do you ensure that uh, the right people are answering your questionnaire? So that's data collection techniques. Then comes the word instrumentation. Now this one, uh, there are two types of, uh, of instruments. One is the researcher, researcher completed instrument. Like you do a checklist. You are the re researcher collecting data. You interview people. That's which way. If you give a questionnaire, you ask them to answer a psychological test. That is subject completed instrument. Now, when instruments, be very, very careful here. Tell the reader, is this instrument taken from some source? Are you adopting it wholesale? Okay, tell who is the later the instrument. Secondly, if you're adapting the instrument, tell the reader you're adapting the instrument or you're building your own. You got to be very clear. Your whole research depends on this. You get your instruments wrong, your data goes out. So but tell the reader in your research proposal, the source, who is the author. Okay, were there changes made? Is there revision made to the instrument? The number of items in the instrument, the dimensions of the instrument, the subscale. Give some sample of items. How is it scaled? Is it a liquid scale? Or is it a close yes, no answer? Or is it open-ended? Okay, the changes you have made to the instrument, rational for the changes. If it's a new instrument, give in detail how you develop the instrument. Okay, uh, check for culture biasness, okay, uh, or, or, or sensitivity of culture in your instrument. Okay, certain words and all that. Tell the reader, I, I check for this reliability and validity. I don't want to go into detail, but that those two are very, they'll question you. What kind of internal, internal consistency of the items in your instrument? What are reliability coefficients of an instrument? Validity, does it measure what it's supposed to measure? That is instrument. Tell all this in your thing. Then the pilot testing, you'll be asked. This is a very common question you'll be asked. How are you going to pilot test the instrument? Before they ask the question, write it down in your research proposal. Tell how you pilot test. Pilot test is getting a small sample and thing. And sometimes the readers will question, why do you choose this? You took 10 people. Why 10? You have to explain why 10. Why 20? Why not 5? So you explain for pilot testing your instrument. Check for content validity, what is supposed to measure. Okay? Don't take on block. A lot of instruments in the social Britain come from United States, Britain, Australia, New Zealand, and we, we use a lot of these instruments. Be very careful. Analyze every item. Do they understand? That's internal content. Make sure the students understand the questions in the same way as another person. Internal consistency, reliability of the items. They very popular. Many use Cronbach Alpha. Okay, if you want to stretch it further, you could use factor analysis. 
subjects involved in the pilot test. Check for cultural sensitivity. That's the pilot testing. Now, let, let me end this. Uh, sampling. Now, this is a big thing. Sample. People ask you, who's your sample? Why did you choose this sample? What kind of... Why do you choose 150 sample? Characteristics of the sample. Who are they? What do they consist of? Are they according to age level, according to qualification, experience, and so on and so forth? All these you have to tell in your sample, your, your expected sample. You haven't done it yet, but you, you know your sample, right? Uh, reps, how do you ensure that the sample is representative of the population? Uh, this is an important part, representing the population. Make sure. So explain the techniques you will adopt in making sure the sample is representative of the population. Your sampling method, there may several sampling methods. You, you, purposive sampling and so on. If you do uh, purposive sampling, why? Okay. If you're doing stratifying your sample, why? Sample size, now, this is a big issue. There is... <laughs> Nobody will commit what is the appropriate size. You you decide. Okay, with your supervisor, justify that the sample is adequate. adequate. Usually they say the bigger the better, but not necessarily so. What's important is that your sample size can capture the kind of information you need to answer your research question. And finally, ethics. Make sure that you indicate your protection of human subjects, things like uh, confidentiality, things like uh, uh, protection. Yeah, confidentiality is most important, and there is no way the, the 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 items inside there will hurt hurt a particular community. Be very very careful, religion and the kind of things. Be very careful ethic protection of human subject, and especially if you are working with uh, young children, all the more you should emphasize. You might even have to get consent from the parent. For protection of human subjects. So this is the sampling part. Explain as detail, very precisely. Don't waste your time uh, uh, talking about the theory uh, of sampling. No. You tell the reader, this is how I'm going to get my sample. That's it. Don't go dwell explaining what is purposive sampling. No. The reader knows what is purposive sampling. Convenient sampling. Random sampling. He knows. He knows what it is. But you how do you use those tools? Okay, finally, the data analysis. You tell a little bit, short section, how you intend to analyze the data, the statistical tools you intend to use. Maybe for tests for differences, you might use the T-test, one-way ANOVA, MANOVA. MANOVA is multivariate analysis. You have more than one dependent variable. You test for relationships. Maybe use correlation, multiple regression. Multiple regression is good for prediction. Okay, path analysis. And then factor analysis and statistical packages. You can mention SPSS and NCS among them. So finally, the important part is the go back to the three C's: clear, concise, and coherent. Okay. Far too often I see research proposals. I use the word rambling. Get to the point. Get to the point. Be precise. Actually, every sentence you write in your research proposal, you must know. Oftentimes, when you go for your defense, it is worth, uh, uh, the, the reader will just pick up a sentence. What do you mean by this? And if you cannot answer the question, it's very embarrassing. So every line you write, you make sure you know what it means. Okay? You, there are 10,000, 9,000 words. Make sure that every word and line you write in your research proposal. Remember, the person reading is a complete stranger. And you're going to write for him and make sure the same. The more precise you are, the more clear. And the way you defend, you convince. You can have no problem with your defense of your research proposal. I, I like what Einstein said. Everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. I practice this as much as I can in whatever I do and write. Uh, if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. He even went further and said, if you can't explain it to a six-year-old, you don't understand it well enough. This is happens to lots of doctoral students. You cannot explain means you don't understand. So that's why I said every word and sentence counts in your this thing. Every time you write, do I know what I mean or not? 
Is there a flow, coherence? Okay, is it clear? Keep these three words in mind. Clarity, concise, and coherence. Coherence the flow. Okay, so basically the research proposed to sell yourself. And I have a website there. It's just type in into Google Valmiki Academy. Uh, Valmiki Academy, just as it. I have a whole section on uh, on the research proposal. Lots of videos there. For everything that I've said in this webinar, there are lots of the videos to explain in detail with examples. So that is my presentation, and thank you very much. Uh, maybe I'll look at some questions. Or oh, somebody worried about the words. Yeah, you can exceed it. It doesn't have to, don't have to worry too much about the words, but I, what I want is precision. Okay. Uh, any? Uh, I've used conceptual. Should I focus on theory too? The conceptual framework is your creation. Theory is, is what other people have done. The theories of other people. Okay. Draw on the theories of other people. Okay. Uh, any questions? Okay. Uh, please go through the videos. Some of them are very, very good. Uh, okay. Uh, coming to the end of our session. Any, any more? Okay, that's uh, my draft of research proposal. Thirteen thousand. It's okay. It's okay. Thirteen thousand. Don't, don't don't get hung up by the words. What I gave was a very rough. Some universities overseas, if for their doctoral uh, thesis, just ask for two thousand words proposal. I, I you can see that. So I I use that figure of a number is just to so that you concretize what you want to study. If you have a very vague idea of what you want to study, yeah, and then when you actually get on with it, oh, you get a lot of trouble. It's nice, the idea of somebody outside looking at your work and telling you, can you do this? Why did you leave this out? Okay, Why didn't you? Your research question doesn't reflect that kind of words. You know, Your theoretical framework is not obvious. It's not, you're not explained in detail. Okay, your conceptual framework is confusing. These are all the words that come up during your defense of your of your research proposal. So it's good to get it right there, and then when you start your work, it, it, you smooth sailing after that. That's why in my student, I insist you get your research proposal proposal right. It takes a long time, but unfortunately, that is the only way to go about. I feel to go about the, the, for the doctoral program to get it right. Trying to do it, get it right the first time. I don't want your research proposal to be rejected and they go back again doing all of it. Okay. Uh, I hope it's clear. Okay. Everybody is, seems to be very happy. Okay. Uh, uh, how much maximum time is proposal writing and defense? Oh. That depends. I've had, uh, there are students walking around. Oh, this is a very good, it's a kind of humorous thing. I meet my students in, when I was in the former university. It is a conventional university. I used to meet the students after two years. I, I, I'll ask him, what are you doing here? Haven't you finished your, your, your thesis? No, my problem is searching for a problem. So he's still searching for his problem statement. My problem is searching for a problem. So it's true. You can go on looking for spending time. Try not to zero in, zero in. Uh, PhD and D, or somebody's asking for PhD and DBA. Usually DBA, EDD, these are professional doctoral programs which has a large component of coursework. It might be in, in Malaysia, it's about 40, 40 uh, half, half. Half thesis, half uh, uh, coursework. 
so is the coursework. So that's the difference. And the focus of those kind of doctoral degrees is usually uh, for practitioners. Okay, they call it scholar practitioners, so the DBA, EDD, and a few other professional doctoral programs. That's the difference. Okay, uh, could you please share the link to the web? Yeah, the link is there. Uh, it's HTTPS. Uh, okay, I, I, I'll punch it into the thing. HTTPS. B A L M I K I Academy A K A C E M Y dot com. And uh, this website is being used quite extensively. Uh, I've, I've just passed it around. Uh, you, oh, some destination cannot get it. You, you just go to Google and type Bell Mickey Academy. Well, Mickey, it's on the PowerPoint slides there. Okay. So, okay, I'll stop here. My one hour. Uh, how important is the technology? How important is the technology? Those who want to help themselves will benefit. Oh, I don't know what you mean. How important is the technology? The technology. Hmm. Technology will be... The, in research, uh, obviously, you may need the software for, for quantitative research. You may need software for data analysis. Okay? Data analysis. Main roles of the supervisor. Oh, I, 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 that's what I was thinking of having another session on that. Uh, what should the, should the research be aligned to specific philosophy? Uh, it's it's up to you. You 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 decide. It's not so much uh, because the quantitative research is based on the positivist philosophy. Okay, quantitative research. So if you are working on topics like non-quantitative, yeah, you might subscribe to a particular philosophy, and then uh, do base your research on that philosophy. Yes, that is possible in qualitative research. Okay. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Okay. So one hour is up. Okay. I'll stop here and thank you very much for all your attention. Thank you.